Hello, everybody, and welcome to Chapter 10 in the Content Marketing Course, where this is all about sharing content on social media. We're going to look at different types of content, or at least the major four types that we've already covered here in the courseware. I'm going to try to go through everything here in one fell swoop. I was originally going to do one piece of content per video, but I just cut down the slides a little bit. And now I'm going to be hopefully a little bit more lean and uh, concise on what we're going to be going over here. So if we jump ahead, I did want to start with this question. And before you're going to post on social media, be sure to ask, how is this content going to educate, inform, or inspire the audience? This is a very straightforward question, but at the same time, if you can't answer this question, your audience probably won't actually get educated, informed, or inspired. This is a very important piece to think about because when you are sharing content on social media, many brands are looking for a lot of content being shared on a consistent basis. And as a result, it's easy for us to lose sight of the stuff that matters to our audience and when it all comes down to it, we need to we need to share value. We need to show value on social media. And when we do that, we get the engagements that we want, further reach, all the analytics that we're looking for. But too often we find posts that fall flat. And it's not just random. It's usually because the posts, honestly, people find boring. And it's something that might be an organizational requirement. Like, oh, we got to share this article today. But uh, if you have the the pull, if you have the clout within the organization, you want to make sure that if you can't answer this question, that you are not actually sharing it. So before we dig in, on each type of content, I do have some best practices. However, uh, this post from Falcon IO is a good example of some just general best practices when it comes to sharing content on social media. First, concise messaging. This is a great example. One statement in an emoji needs to be attention grabbing i think we all knew that it needs to accurately reflect your brand or an extension of the brand if you're going to go the uh, wendy's on twitter route you also need to promote more than your own content you need to share other stuff now falcon io is sharing their own stuff here so that doesn't work but it's okay to share third-party content and i heard a, a reference to news jacking as they call it or you're sharing other people's articles i don't think it's jacking anything people want their articles shared widely as long as you're giving credit you're linking over to the website and you're sharing your perspective on it you should be okay then also when you're posting you want to make sure that you're furthering your content marketing goals and you, usually when you post third-party content you're looking to drive thought leadership um, and it's more education but at the same time, when you have Falcon IO here and the example sharing their own stuff, there are other content marketing goals that they're trying to push. Uh, some examples would be, hey, we need visitors, we need engagements, we need subscribers, things like that that would come from a high click-through rate. So let's start with the written content. This is an example of a uh, LinkedIn post from Zynga and their CEO in an article. This is the earned media that they're sharing. Um, it's not their content. They're sharing some earned media, but um, it's connecting back to the brand and it's new and timely. And so it's good for um, for the brand, for Zynga. And, you know, it fits really well. It's a, it's a no brainer. It's the kind of content that does work for a company that is looking to share content on a regular basis. And for something like LinkedIn, a lot of companies use that for sharing their own earned, the earned media spots. Um, and especially sit down interviews like this, where the CEO was the focal point of the interview. Now, on the other hand, if you have Facebook here, um, this is a blog about, um, there's a, an event called the Dog Bowl and Balloons Over Bavarian and it was a goofy event. Um, the post is short, two sentences, some emojis, they tag the other page. And the photo is actually what you're seeing first. However, this is not actually a photo that was uploaded. This is a called a link preview. And for those of you who don't know what that is, uh, this is a link preview in the flesh. You would post, uh, you would copy and paste a link into the body of the post and it will automatically generate an image from the, from the post as well as it'll pull the metadata, the title and the description. Now you can use the link preview to your advantage. Usually um, it will, on Twitter at least, your URL will be hidden if you use the link preview. On Facebook, you actually have to delete the URL. 
I think it's perfectly fine to delete the URL. The link preview will still be there. It will still work. Everything will still be fine. I have not seen any data that shows whether or not deleting the URL is better for any sort of engagements, but I think the post just looks cleaner. Additionally, the link preview shows context, shares context, but then at the same time, when you look at the text in the link preview, you need to make sure that you're not duplicating efforts and saying the same thing in the text above. So on this example of the Frankenmuth dog show, um, they do a very good job of not duplicating this, right? If it said the ideal way to spend your weekend involved really cute dogs, not air balloons, and then it said that right here in the link preview as well, you are just duplicating efforts. You have a very limited amount of real estate with social media. And so you need to take advantage of that and you need to post unique content and you need to use that to share something that's not going to be repeated as soon as they scroll down to the bottom of the post. Um, also be careful with the whole show more thing. This doesn't happen here, but with LinkedIn specifically, um, after a couple of lines, it's going to cut you off and you'll still see the link preview, but you're going to need people to say, to click the little show more bit that will then show the rest of your post. Um, so you just want to be mindful of that and just make sure to look at your post after you publish it, make sure the text isn't getting cut off at an inopportune time. So now let's look at video content. This is the one section that I'm not going, or I have some text slides, um, you know, where to share social media, uh, networks prefer native video uploads. YouTube gives you the long-term benefits. Uh, I mentioned in the last chapter video that if you are uploading a video to Facebook, that's great for three days. And then after that, you're better off posting something to YouTube. I would recommend posting one to both, post a video to social media and post a video to YouTube. It can be the same video, but at the same time, just know you're probably gonna get more traction out of the Facebook one immediately and the YouTube one more long-term. But you do need to ask yourself some questions when sharing videos. One, what's the goal of the video? Should it actually be on social media? Um, if it's a commercial, if it's something that's way overly produced, might not work so well. Um, how is it going to be linked from other content? Is there a unique URL? Like if somebody wants to share the video, can they do it? Um, a lot of times you see this, you know, like TikTok, it's pretty easy to share a video, repost it. But at the same time, other social networks do not have as easy of a time doing that. Just make sure that it's shareable. And then also, is it going to resonate with your audience? The biggest uh, faux pas I've ever seen is when... Um, funny enough, Subway, which is us, um, I talked about in the last chapter as having a best practice type of social media post. They used to promote on Twitter their social media commercials, their ads that they would run on TV. And I thought, this has got to be the biggest waste of money I've ever seen. I couldn't screenshot it. I didn't, I was had no way to record it, but I wanted to use it as like a bad example because it was literally just the same 30 second spot that you would have seen if you were sitting at home watching TV. So um, and that's clearly not going to resonate with the audience. So here's an example, BurgerFi. There's a link to the BurgerFi video in the textbook. Um, this is, you know, they were shot there. The video shows all sorts of ways that you can, uh, they're in Florida that you can get, uh, they can utilize their services. They have a truck, um, for all sorts of different events. And it's a nice little video on Instagram. Now this is already outdated because, um, if you were doing a video today, I would say it needs to be a reel and it needs to be vertical, but this is two years old now. So, um, not the case. And also when you're talking about reels specifically, actually make sure if there's something else here. Yeah. Talking about reels specifically, you need to make sure that you have a description and a caption. Um, the videos are going to usually play on mute by default, unless you unmute them, of course. And that's the same with Facebook and Twitter and everybody else. But users can, you can stop the scroll if you have captions and if you have some sort of something for them to read off the bat. If a video starts with like a long drawn out landscape shot of like the sky and there's no music, there's nobody talking, nothing's going to work. It's not, people aren't going to stick around. You need to capture their attention immediately. And we, I like to uh, talk about accessibility here where you need to be able to, you need to provide captions because um, just because videos play on mute doesn't mean everybody can unmute it. There's a large population of individuals here that either have um, actual disabilities such as you know, hearing impaired, but others have legitimate like technology issues where they're not going to be able to hear um, the audio that's coming out of a video. When you look at it, when you think about accessibility, it's not just about people with disabilities, but it's about technology accessibility. 
Um, we, a lot of us take technology for granted today and that we can all connect to Wi-Fi. We all have smartphones. Um, and most of us have computers at some level. Um, but a large number of our audience, no matter who our target audience is, unless you're tar unless you sell private jets and you're trying to target millionaires and billionaires, chances are a good a number of your target audience is going to have some sort of disability, whether that be with them personally or with their use of technology and where they are. So just make sure that your videos are always accessible. And that largely means using captions slash um, subtitles. Now, having said that, I do want to share a couple best practices. Um, making, making sure that there's ample context for your video. Showing a video out of context usually doesn't go so well. And if you're going to be using videos that you don't have the right to use, you're probably going to get caught and your video is going to get either removed um, or your reach is going to get tanked. So just be careful. And for popular music, you know, I wouldn't use it unless it's welcome and expected. So TikTok and Instagram Reels, great examples where you can use popular music and you should. You should look for trending tunes. But if you're on Facebook, for example, or was it really on YouTube even more, um, you got to really be careful because again, if copyright claims don't automatically lead to videos being taken down, um, but they can really crush your the ability for your video to show up in search results, for example. Um, this fourth point, 10 seconds to capture the attention is no longer true. You have like three seconds. Um, Reels and TikTok have really cut this down to being pretty much instantaneous. You need, you need to capture attention instantly. But also different social networks will recommend different lengths. Facebook has said, I think, 30 seconds. Instagram Reels at this point, the data has showed uh, 10 to 20 seconds is ideal. Um, TikTok has, has uh, I mean, they're, in, they're increasing the length of the videos that you can show. But the, the interesting thing is that on TikTok, it's all about the percentage of the video that you watch, whereas on YouTube, it's all about the sheer minutes. So take that for what it's worth. You know, shorter videos on TikTok, longer videos on YouTube is perfectly fine. Um, audio content's a little bit interesting because audio in itself can't really be show promoted, posted as a native form of content on social media. Twitter does have Twitter Spaces, which is an interesting social audio form that is akin to Clubhouse, which is now going out of business. But the cool thing about that is it's still live. So Twitter Spaces isn't really you know, pre-posted, pre-published um, audio content. But if you think about other audio content that could be out there, look at Waze. I mean, they have a really interesting playlist post from um, one of their uh, celebrity endorsers, Boy George. He has a playlist. Um, this did really well. I grabbed this post right after it had gotten posted. So you don't see quite the engagements that it ended up with. But it was really interesting to see how they posted this. Um, a lot of times you are going to need to integrate visuals and what they did here, I thought, I thought was pretty attention grabbing. Um, you also are going to need some text to go with it. Now, another example though, is you could integrate video and this is a podcast by some, a guy that works with the, through the NBA. And here's a really good example of how you, he takes an ex, a snippet of a podcast. He takes probably the most interesting minute of the podcast and then he transcribes it and he posts it here and turns it into a video along with a photo of the guest that was jason tatum from the boston celtics um videos like this actually do really well and it's an easy link over to the full podcast um and you'll see this link by the way will take you over to the spotify app if you happen to have it on your phone and that's how you're looking at the tweet Another really interesting way that I've seen people promote podcasts is they'll just put a photo, an image of like a Word doc up and it's got like the big minute, big moments where a guest will talk about stuff. So it'll say like 754, uh, Jason Tatum talks about what, who his favorite teammate, 1509. Tatum talks about who they want to trade for. Like, you know, he'll like tease it and it makes it so that he's no longer putting all of his eggs in the one basket of the transcription of what you see on the video here. But now he's showing you essentially like an outline of the podcast. So if you want to tune to just one specific spot and listen to it, you can. It also makes it also ensures that you're not missing anything and that he's getting as much mileage out of it as possible, which I think is really smart. Um, 
the other thing too is I use sound waves here, which I think is good because you know they'll move up and down as you watch the video. Um, I'm sure people have seen this before. Um, you can also do behind the scenes photos or any videos of the actual podcast um, if you want. Now, the other best practices, a lot, some of them you see here, one, he's tagging the guest, of course, on social media, you got to do that. Um, if you can add a logo, you can. He has the WojPod logo in the lower right corner, but if you have like a Spotify logo that you could throw on there, and that's where you know, most of your subscribers are, you can do that as well. Finally, you want to try to ins integrate some powerful or inspirational quotes that are from it, which he does here. He just transcribed the whole first, that whole main minute. But if there's one really good quote that came out of it, you could just use that as an image as well, rather than trying to you know, spend all that additional time. It really depends on what kind of time and resources you have available to you when you're promoting a podcast across social media accounts. Then we have visual content. So uh, this is pretty much, you know, Pinterest and Instagram are the big two here. Um, Pinterest is where you can really go to town with visual content where it's the main thing. It's not, the, it's not the only thing because you see there is a title, there is a click-through link, and there's a description, which is pretty interesting. Now, social networks are going to crop your images. Um, Twitter now will no longer crop it because they had found some major problems with cropping. But now, Pinterest, now that neither Pinterest nor Twitter will do that, uh, that gives you a little bit more freedom and you can do some more fun stuff with it. Uh, Pinterest will squeeze your photo if it's too wide. So that is a pro that could be a problem. There are some best practices and what the dimensions should be for a Pinterest image, but just be sure that you're uploading, um, an image that is going to look good in the dimensions with Twitter. If you upload something too wide as well, you're going to kind of, you're going to regret how it looks. It's just going to be really squeezed. And, you know, if you're looking at it on a phone, most people are looking at social media on a phone. You only have 300 pixels across. So you're pretty, you don't have a lot of space, especially if there's a lot of text. Now, when we think about infographics specifically here, this SEO checklist, when you're, you could post it on other social networks, sure, but you want to think about breaking it into blocks and posting it on Twitter, like as a thread. If it's on Facebook, maybe as some separate images. Um, or if you're on LinkedIn or anything else, you know, you could upload it as itself, but you could also break it up into sections and post them one at a time. It gives you more, um, more runway, more content to share, more descriptions that you can write. Uh, and it also makes those sections a little bit easier to read. A pop, an infographic like this is pretty text heavy. So it's going to be hard for somebody to read all of this text on a site like LinkedIn. But if you break it up into sections, now suddenly you've got something that's a little bit more user friendly. But LinkedIn specifically, LinkedIn is uh, really pushing, promoting, pushing uh, slides as visuals. If you were to take each chunk of this SEO checklist infographic, put it into a slideshow and upload all the slides, that's going to do 10 times better than if you just posted this whole infographic as one on LinkedIn. Now there is Instagram here. This is American Airlines uh, behind the scenes of a plane dashboard or whatever. Um, I don't know what the words are, but um, the most common form of visual content on social media are photos and photos are useful because they can connect a brand to followers, candid shots behind the scenes like this one, staff shots, workplace photos, which I guess is also this one. Um, and I didn't love this photo, but I look, when I was looking through I thought, actually, like, this is the only one I could find. Like, I was looking through a lot of different airline social networks. And if you've been following along on my content here, you'll know that air airlines just use Twitter for customer service. And they're starting to do that with other social networks, too. So it was a breath of fresh air for American Airlines to post something behind the scenes. Because also, like, you know, Delta is all about travel and lifestyle lifestyle. Like, they show all these exotic places. Like, oh, you can get here with Delta, which is great, except, like, Sure. Am I, is it really like, I, I can see these photos anywhere I want. There's nothing that makes them unique to the brand other than the fact that I know what Delta's going to give me. So with American Airlines, it was really interesting to show something behind the scenes, something that I did not see. And as I, I mean, I spent hours looking at social media accounts for airlines and this was the only one of like something in a cockpit. So, um, you know, touche American Airlines, this, that was a good job. 
Now, the last slide that I have is about user-generated content. User-generated content is great for visuals. And this is a tweet. And the visuals from users are an easy ask. It's an easy piece of content to promote. And it's, you know, it's not resource intensive and people are happy to do it. With John Deere, if you were to scroll through their Twitter feed, like 90% of their posts are user generated. And you see they give Stacy H the credit and they do, a, this was a, uh, was a Father's Day. Yeah, it was a Father's Day post from 2021. Really nice tugging at the heartstrings type of photo. John Deere, whoever's running the social network, social media there probably saw this come through. They found it in probably 90 seconds, put a, a caption to it, boom, easy. Um, but at the same time, you got to make sure that this kind of content is going to resonate. Sometimes user-generated content does not resonate. Um, but you need to also connect at an emotional level. Again, the John Deere stuff is really good at that. Um, they're very about the kind of the family family uh, values and, and kids and lifetime, lifetime with a John Deere type of thing. Uh, so really smart social media on, on their part because it's also not very time consuming. But when you look at best practices overall and for visuals, the visuals say a lot more than written content and they stop the scroll. So there's a lot more, um, a lot, lot more that you can do with this than say typing out, you know, oh, happy Father's Day. Like everybody's going to say that. How do you stand up from the crowd? But then if we go back to that accessibility thing, you need to make sure that it provide alt text or titles. All the social networks will allow, will allow you to add alt text now and they have varying degrees of limits of characters. I think LinkedIn's was 300 at one point. You just need to make sure to describe it because also if you don't put alt text in photos, there are rumblings around that social networks will start to kill the reach of those images that don't have alt text because they want to make sure that all of their stuff is accessible. So word of the wise, I would always put alt text in every image that you do. It doesn't have to be lengthy. It doesn't have to be super descriptive. It just needs to quickly say, what the image is, um, what's the action that's going on. And as long as it's not purely decorative, just describing it, what's the point of it? Why is it there? Uh, but then also make sure to double check that your images are displaying correctly. You, know, you don't want blurry and cropped images as we talked about in the last slide. But then finally, don't overextend or forget the brand. And this has the John Deere user generated experience here has become the brand really for them. So it really is in line um, and if you are creating an alter ego on social media, like what Wendy's did with Twitter, and there's the example I always go back to, um, just make sure to stay within those guidelines. And uh, with that, you'll be, you'll be okay in terms of posting visuals that are uh, resonating. It's, do, it's uh, providing value. And at the same time, it's still helping to build brand awareness and brand equity. So uh, that should wrap it up. I actually did it pretty quickly. I think it was under 25 minutes. So any questions, feel free to reach out. All of this content is in the extended slide deck that you'll see in the course. And then also um, you'll be able to see more about this and all of these images in the chapters themselves. So uh, without further ado, I will wrap this up and I look forward to seeing you next time.